Uh, today, I'd like to welcome to the Smarter Building Podcast a lady who has had a huge impact on the way we build and will be building moving forwards with her creation and recommendations in the Building a Safer Future report, which was presented to go to Parliament back in 2018. This led to the creation of the Building Safety Act, which has already had a huge impact on all those involved in the building of high-rise buildings over the height of 18 metres and stands to have an even wider impact as secondary legislation is added in the coming months and years. Welcome, Dame Judith Hackett. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Um, I guess today we'll really be focusing around the recommendations of the report, um, looking at the buildings and, and fire, from a fire safety point of view and the Building Safety Act. But before we do that, it'd be really great to understand how, a little bit about your career and how you've ended up um, being an advisor to the government and, and so respected in the industry, really. And I think some of our listeners would be really interested to hear how that's happened. Okay. Well, um, my background is that I'm a chemical engineer. I uh, spent many years working in the chemical industry. Um, so safety was always very much a part of, of what we what we did and part of how we operated in, in that industry for the many years that I worked there. Um, and then in uh, 2007, I became the chair of the health and safety executive. So uh, I spent nearly a decade as the chair of uh, the UK's regulator for health and safety in all workplaces. So um, in in that role, got very, uh, very much involved in, in looking at what good regulation looks like because we have an excellent health and safety regime uh, in the UK for workplace safety. Um, and I stepped down from that role in 2016, just about a year before the horrific fire at Grenfell. Okay, fantastic. And then I'm assuming the, the government sort of knew of your expertise and, and wanted to involve you. Well, the Health and Safety Executive is an arm's length body of government. So yes, I've worked very closely with a number of different ministers uh, during my time as chair of HSE. Um, and the call was to me after the tragedy at Grenfell was to say, can you take a look at the regulatory system that relates to how we do building regulations and fire safety and tell us how we ended up in a situation where this awful tragedy has happened. And not the detail of what happened at Grenfell itself, but to look at how we had ended up in a situation where not only had the tragedy at Grenfell occurred, but also in the weeks that followed that, the initial indications were that there were many more buildings with um, similar concerns about safety. So this was not a one-off and there was a much bigger problem that needed to be uncovered. So in terms of putting together that report, you would have obviously looked at what happened at Grenfell, but were you studying other buildings, other live projects, or was it? How did how did that sort yes. of team come? Again? It's an interesting question when you when when you're tasked with doing a piece of work like this, and you come in from outside. It it's an important starting point to think about. So how am I going to do this? What am I going to look at? So I guess in, in many ways, my training as an engineer helped me in as much as what it was clear to me I needed to do was to map out how the system that we had in place, the regulatory system, was supposed to work and then look at where the failures had, occur and had occurred. And that's exactly what I did. And anyone who has looked at the the interim report that we published in November in 2017, um, there was a big fold-out map in the back that showed you exactly how complicated the system had evolved to become. Uh, and it was pretty clear to anyone who looked at that that it was never going to work because it was too complicated. And there were too many um, Bureauc bureaucracies involved and as a result of that people were taking shortcuts and finding ways to work around it okay and and i guess then the other side of that is in making those recommendations do you think the government has gone far enough to respond to them i think 
you know, I read I read part of it the other the other evening just to to sort of refresh my memory. And it, you described the ignorance, indifference, lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities, and inadequate regulatory oversight and enforcement tools. So it was a pretty scathing from all angles report on what was going on. And some of the the key takeaways were to, as you say, look at the, look at it um, from a entire system point of view rather than yes rather than absolutely small that's that systems approach was really important uh, okay several questions there first of all has the government gone far enough i i think it it's it has to be said that the government has done exactly what i asked them to do which was not to check cherry pick from my recommendations okay. and the way in which they have uh, gone about developing the building safety act has remained very true to those recommendations. So, in in that respect, I have no um, no no complaint at all. They've done exactly what I said needed to be done. But what it is important to remember is that the regulatory framework is only the starting point. What I also said in that report was that we've got to drive the right behaviours, drive the right culture, and there needs to be a massive culture change throughout the whole industry. Um, and I think what well, the phase we're in now, clearly, as the as the regulation uh, takes hold uh, and as people become ever ever more aware of the new responsibilities and new duties that the Act is going to bring, people are really now starting to get their heads around what does this mean? What are we going to have to do differently? Um, so the regulatory framework is now there. But that's the starting point at which those behaviours, for many people, will will begin to shift. The smart ones started a long while ago, got the message in the early days. But there's still an awful lot of people in the industry who claim to be still waiting for more detail and whatever other excuses they can think up why they haven't got on with it yet. But they really should be getting on with it now because we are getting close to the point where you know, the regulations really are going to bite. And by the way, in the meantime, the people who really, really uh, had a, a very difficult time, I think, for the last six years are those who live in buildings that have already been built and were not built to the right standards. Uh, and, and we should think about the plight of the residents and how difficult this has been for them. Yeah. Is that, do you mean that from an uncertainty point of view? And I, I guess I'm fortunate not to live in a building over 18 metres high, but if you are, you're, you're, you're waiting, aren't you? And you're, you're probably nervous. Yes, you are. You're waiting to know whether, whether your building needs remediation. Uh, we've been through a whole, um, a whole series of phases of where, where some of those residents have been hit for costs that they never should have been asked to pay because it was not their fault. They were not the, the, the ones who, who created these buildings uh, to, to poor standards in the first place. And even where they've not had to pay, we've seen residents for months have their lives disturbed by the work that then has to take place to remediate the buildings. Yeah. It's, I find it interesting that you um, support the government to a degree in terms of how they've implemented the BSA because there's a lot of people who have been taking shots at the government and the BSA and how they're waiting, as you say, waiting for more detail and more information. Um, but there are a lot of organizations just getting on with things and and looking to work in a better yes. way. Uh, for, from our point of view, we, we do a lot of consultancy around BIM standards. And historically, I feel people have been paying lip service to, to that. The Building Safety Act and the data that's required to be collected enforces it more than anything has historically. Oh, absolutely. I, th I think there are some, some really interesting questions to be asked of, of this whole sector. So, um, as I said, I came in from, from outside of the construction industry. My, my career had been spent in chemicals. So when I asked the sorts of questions that felt pretty standard to me from my industry background and said, where are the records? How do you manage change? Who records what's been changed when buildings are changed. I was stunned by the answers because in most cases, it was no one knows. 
So it, it really was a shock to me to realize just how far behind many other industry sectors this particular part of, of construction, the built environment part, is in terms of adopting what are standard technologies in so many other industries. Yeah. And you made reference to um, to a golden thread of information. Is that something that you brought yeah. in from other sectors or is that just something you felt was a requirement? Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean and understand that to be because i've i again i've heard multiple interpretations as, as people take and warp it for their own needs yeah, a little bit yeah it it means it means a number of different things right well one is that that the process of building and let's focus on high-rise buildings for now because for me they are they are particularly complex buildings right because multiple people are going to live there who controls what goes on there? Who who has overall responsibility for ensuring that the totality of the building is safe and remains safe? It is quite a complex issue when it's multiple occupancy. So the first thing that happens is that uh, a design is is proposed for for that building, but then the way in which Things are then executed through a design and build contract means that what actually gets built may be significantly different from what was originally intended and proposed at the design stage. So point number one in terms of golden thread is we need to have a record of what was intended, did what was intended get built, and if not, why was it changed, how was it changed, and can we still be satisfied that we have a an actual as built that is um, that, that is of of a satisfactory standard that we can be confident that it's safe for people to live in? The next thing then is that when that building passes on into occupancy and ownership, the only way in which the people who are responsible for managing that property can do that throughout its lifetime is if they understand what it is they're working with and they too then keep records of any changes that they subsequently make. Um, and, and so that golden thread has to run not just through the design and build phase, but on into the occupation of the building as well. Okay. It's like the life story of the building. Yep. That's fantastic. You, you, you proposed a building safety manager to, to oversee the ongoing management and and, and yeah. control of that data. I, know, I see that's something that hasn't really been enforced, and I think it's probably a, a cost thing to have a person involved. Do you, do you see that at least that requirement's being met, but in a different way, or do you see that as a bit of a hole? Yes, exactly okay. right. The requirement and the what I was trying to achieve will, I am confident, still happen. The reason that the the specifics of a building safety manager were removed from the act was because people were concerned about a single individual within an, a corporate organization having their name on a piece of paper. So, the, yep. so the, the only change in the act was that ability to actually say, this building is managed by this organization rather than this individual. But it, it, it doesn't in any way, for me, detract from the fact that we will have clear line of sight on who is responsible for that building, which is what okay. matters. And that accountable and in some sense responsible person is is constantly updated yep. as the building moves through its through its stages and we and yes. we always have a yes. as you say. I okay. Yeah, I, I get that as well. You know, what person in an organization is gonna sign up to have that weight on their shoulders? It's probably not 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 yeah. hugely fair, um, especially with some of these, yeah. these high rise buildings. Yeah. Okay. Moving moving forward a little bit, um, with regards to a lot of this, there was a proposed date of first of October. I don't know if that's still the date where a lot of this legislation would come into force and the the regulatory body would be making those first series of checks and potentially fining organisations who weren't compliant um, in the fashion they should be. Do you think the regula regulatory body is there and ready to do that? Um, 
And and do you think the first of October is a realistic date, or do you think that'll end up getting pushed? There's probably a couple of questions in there as well. Uh, do I think do I think they're ready? Yes, I do. I I uh, I am hugely impressed at the at the way in which uh, the building safety regulator has actually been stood up um, with the resources that have been put into it. Uh, that they're they're properly resourcing it. Um, and what's been really interesting, I think, is that when they've gone out to recruit to get additional resources, there's been no shortage of people wanting to become part of this new regulatory body. People recognise it as being important, uh, as being a, a, a really uh, much needed new regulator, and they want to be part of it. So that's all to the good. Um, so will we be ready to go on the 1st of October? Yes. Um but it, it, but it is a start date. You know, if people are expecting this army of, of inspectors to come out on the 1st of October, that isn't how it's going to work. Because we've got two distinct um, work streams here. One is what will happen from the 1st of October in relation to new buildings, where there will be a new process that they will now go through where not only will they have to do gateway one, Applicate planning application stage, um, after putting that to the regulator, but there will also be the implementation then of the subsequent stages during construction and before occupation that they will have to, have to pass through those gateways by preparing the safety case. So you're going to see a whole new, much more rigorous process around new build. But on the 1st of October as well, that's the point at which all existing high-rise buildings have to be registered. So that's the yep. deadline that started 1st of April. They all have to be registered by uh, 1st of October. Once that's done, the regulator will then start to look at the totality of that list of existing buildings and they will do a risk assessment on which are the highest priority ones that they need to look at and assess of, of the existing stock. So some may well not see uh, a lot of regulatory uh, of the existing buildings, may not see a high level of regulatory activity for some time. Yep. Others may see it very quickly indeed. You may or may not have it. Do you have any visibility of organizations signing up and submitting details of their buildings thus far or is that going somewhere else i don't have that detail to hand um but i do i do meet regularly with the building safety regulator and and i know that they are being kept very busy uh not just in terms of receiving information but also in providing advice and guidance to people on what's coming what they need to do and by when and so okay. on okay so it's it is underway, I guess, and and and, and happens. Oh yes, because okay. I definitely. think there are a few organisations who who just don't believe it's happening. You know, I think it's taken the ostrich approach possibly, and um, are going to be scrambling around in September and or hoping for, hoping for. Well, as, as as I've said, that's been that's been the case from the outset since since the completion of my final report in May 2018. I then switched over to chairing the industry safety steering group that was trying to drive that culture change and what we've observed in that process over the last five years has been as i said earlier some companies get it some who, who have immediately switched on their resources and are seeing the benefits of doing things the right way but also an awful lot of other organizations who are resisting the change or simply burying their heads in the sand and hoping it won't happen. Yep. Okay. And in terms of getting to those organisations, how does the regulatory body identify a building that hasn't been submitted as over eighteen metres? Is there any is there any way to do that? I, I was kind of thinking about this the other day. I was like, well, if somebody doesn't declare their building, you're not. I'm presuming you're not going to have people walking around looking at buildings and going, it's quite high and. You talked earlier about technology, right? I, I, th I think uh, it, 
common sense would have to tell you that there are a number of different ways that the technology can can whether that's Google Maps or whatever it is, can all help you to identify where those buildings are. And let's not lose sight of the fact that um, this, the building safety regulator is not acting in isolation. We've had six years now of the fire service and, and others doing surveys of existing buildings. So there is a wealth of data about what is out there. So it won't be that difficult to compare the data from the last six years with those that actually come forward and register and see where the gaps yep. are. Okay. So we just better wake, wake some of our ostriches up and uh, try and get that data in yes. to help, help them and us. Yes. I think it, uh, anyone who thinks they can not bother registering and get away with it is, again, fooling themselves. Yep. Okay. And in terms of the introduction of this legislation, how, do you think it slots quite nicely in alongside the Fire Safety Act and the Housing Act? It seems to be complementary to someone who who's not yes, very. Yes, I, I think you know policy. One of the things that the policymakers have done a very good job of is ensuring that they are joined up uh, and that they do work well together, um, and that that is particularly important. But it's not just about ensuring that all of the the rules and everything that's written in law works well. I think it is really important for people to recognise that all of the actors involved in this, building control, fire service, building safety regulator, they're working very closely together as individuals and they will collaborate, they will share information and share data. So they know that they... There is a joint regulators group. They meet regularly. They talk to one another. So this is a very joined up process. Fantastic. And now switching back and back or forward or, or where to the, to the technology. Yeah, um, we are obviously a sort of tech heavy podcast. So have you seen best case scenario of te best, what's the word, best implementations of technology to support this are you expecting technology providers to step up a bit more um what's your exposure to technology in supporting this um especially the golden thread element and what do you need think we need to be doing moving forwards um certainly i've seen i've seen lots of of uh proposed solutions coming forward for an awful lot of, lot of people um i went to digital construction week this year um, saw, saw quite a lot of the things that are going on there. And I have to say, I'm impressed. I'm impressed not just by the quantity, but also by the, the thought that appears to have gone into many of those solutions that are being offered. I think the risk at this point is one of confusion. Um, there are so many different solutions on offer. Uh, we, those very same people who have been hoping they wouldn't have to do it at all. And I'm going to say, I don't know which one to choose. So that that could be a challenge. Um, but but having said that, I, th I think there, there is a lot of activity out there. There are a lot of new, new solutions available and um, so much to the good because, as I said, I think this industry has a lot to catch up on in terms of adopting digital technologies to assist not just in recording the information, but in things like monitoring the process of the build. Um, so if, if in new build from now on, everything gets recorded on paper, that would be ridiculous in my view. The ability to make that uh, digital record as the building is built needs to be seized with both hands in my view. I think the other thing that, listening to people is they're always asking for does will this make me bsa compliant from a technology provider do you think there's room for sort of leniency for the organizations who are clearly trying to do the right thing and trying to record all the data and using systems and and making a substantial effort and maybe not quite getting it right the first time around but learning and building and developing because it's a new requirement, especially if you look at something like uh, the British standard relating to how you should capture this information now. There's been a bit of criticism of that as well. So I know it's fire safety and it has to be right and it 
has to give an auditable history. But yeah. I don't know, there seems to be organisations who are paralysed by wanting to do the exact right thing rather than cracking on and collecting more and better data. I understand that. I understand that. And I, and I think what, what that demonstrates to me is, is, is the need for people to get much clearer in their heads about what, what it is they need to do. And, and what it is they need to do is to do exactly what you've said, which is to do their very best and do the right thing. The regulator is not going to tell you exactly what you need to do. So all of these people who are saying, I'm waiting for more information before I jump, it, it, that information you're waiting for isn't going to come if it's if it's at the detailed level. Um, one of the things I've heard said several times in recent months has been, all that's being asked of you is that you do what you always should have been doing. Yep. This is not about building to new standards that are much, much higher than they ever were before. This is about building buildings to the standard they should have been built to, but where corners were being cut and shortcuts were being taken. Yep. It's pretty pretty clear guidance. Um, in terms of what this the Building Safety Act covers at the moment, it's I know it's advisory for everything. Uh, oh, it's not the right word. It it's clear on this should be applied across the board but the legislation the legislation yes. um is all around 18 plus meter buildings what I, th I think you've just answered the question but what should what should those buildings smaller um buildings or residential housing and things like that work should should they be just focusing on this as mandated for everything should they the message should be very. The message should be very clear, right? The time for poor, the time when poor workmanship was going to get through has gone, and this is a real wake-up call to the whole industry to say, raise your standards across the board. The focus of the legislation is on the buildings of highest risk, where. In the event of a fire or a structural collapse, the consequences of that happening would be greatest in those buildings that are high-rise, multiple occupancy. So it's all about priorities and prioritizing the focus and the amount of attention on those buildings of highest risk. But the underlying message is very clear. Those same high standards of construction should be applied everywhere, but that same level of rigor around preparing safety cases and applying that regulatory oversight should not be necessary unless the industry continues to game the system by assuming that they only need to adopt good practices for those high-rise buildings and they continue to do shoddy work on buildings lower in height and occupancy so you think at that point the government would act and continue to extend legislation yes. across and the and the wording is already there in the act that says we can come back and we can look again at whether the scope needs to be extended fantastic and in terms of engagement and an additional involvement are there is this something you continue to be involved in are the stakeholders from industry continuing to be consulted, involved in shaping it? Very yeah. much so. Okay. Very much so. So I, um, I, I as I said, I, I meet regularly with the new regulator. I chair the transition board to ensure that the, the regulatory body is, is set up and, and all of the duties transfer over to them and so on. And I also continue to chair the industry safety steering group. So yes, I'm, I'm still involved. Um, not to the same extent that I was. And of course, no, as soon as the regulator is stood up, I will take an even bigger step back and let them get on with it. That, that's how it needs to work. But um, I always said that I wasn't going to do this piece of work and put all of the effort in that I did without sticking around to make sure that it gets implemented successfully. And that's yep. what I've done. Okay. And then I guess the question is, what, what next when you get a little bit more 
time to to look at other projects possibly well um there is still a big piece of work to be done we focused very much in this discussion on getting the buildings right uh but you will also be aware that uh I said in my report there was at least as much work to be done on ensuring that we use the right products and that we have the right means to test and assure the quality of construction products. Uh, that work is some, uh, some way behind the work that we're doing on the, the regulatory framework around the buildings themselves, but it's an area that we have to fix because otherwise it will leave a big hole in the system. If we do all of this work around a new regulatory regime and we don't ensure that the materials that we're using to build the buildings are fit for purpose and have passed the tests that they need to pass to, to satisfy us all that they're safe, then, then we will have left a hole in the system. I'm going to be spending some time on that uh, because it's important to complete the picture. So that's one of the things that's on the horizon okay, for me. Okay, perfect. And do, you, do you think all of this will have a significant cost implication in terms of ensuring you know i think a lot of the a lot of the shoddy practices are possibly driven by cost engineering and people trying to cut corners as you kind of mentioned earlier do you think that the fact that they now have to deliver to stand to a certain standard um materials of a certain standard materials probably of a certain sustainability uh level do you think that's going to have a big impact for everybody looking to build or own a, a, a builder? It might do in some cases, but what I also know is that the current methods and the current practices of building buildings leads to an awful lot of waste and rework. Uh, so I am firmly of the view that this doesn't have to be a costly exercise. And we, we have actually, I have actually spoken to people, some of those smart people who have got on the case and got onto it quickly, who are already telling me that they're seeing business benefits from doing this, not cost. Okay. So I think approached in the right way, it doesn't have to cost more. Fantastic. Okay. I think that's a sort of a good place to stop and, and thank you very much for joining me today. I think, you know, it's, it's been awesome to have you on the Smarter Building podcast. I've really enjoyed your insights and I know this is a key topic for a lot of our listeners, so I know they will will too. So thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.